Hello, George Creamer here, Missional Instructor, and in this video I will provide a review of how God's mission is realized through the rule of King David. There was a missional purpose behind God appointing David as king over Israel. Also, I will show how the promises made to David are a continuation of, of God's faithfulness to the previous covenants established through Abraham and Moses. God's promises and purposes for his people, Israel, are never for their sake alone, but through them, God will reach the world and draw the nations into a relationship with him. Before I begin, it is important to set the context which leads to the anointing of David as king. Throughout the book of the Judges, the situation and the life of God's people deteriorated to the point where Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And we read that in Judges 21, 25. God's chosen people lacked the spiritual vitality to follow his will and direction in their lives. In the same verse, it also says, In these days there was no king in Israel. Yahweh was supposed to be the king of Israel, who appointed judges to lead his people. Unfortunately, Israel as a whole rejected the kingship of Yahweh, and overall, the leadership under the appointed judges was a complete failure, and their allegiance to Yahweh disintegrated. Instead of being a contrast nation under the kingship of Yahweh, they wanted a king like the other nations had. God should have been their king, but they rejected his lordship and were set on doing things their own way. Yahweh attests to this in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7, and says, They have rejected me from being king over them. Their rejection is also mentioned by the prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel 12, 12. And Samuel says, You said to me, No, but a king shall reign, reign over us when the Lord your, your God was your king. Israel's sin was plainly a rejection of their loving and faithful God. The leadership arrangement under the judges and later Saul failed. It was evident that the people of God needed a change so they can fulfill their call as God's people. A different type of leader was needed to mediate God's covenant and guide Israel back to their missional purpose to the nations. They did not need a king as all the nations have as the people requested in 1 Samuel 8.5. Instead, they needed a divine king, chosen by God himself instead of Israel, who would be God's representative on earth. This leader would guide Israel to follow and fulfill their calling amongst the nations which, so far, they had failed to accomplish. This ideal king would possess all the character qualities that the people really needed, which was in line with God's heart. Through David, God was planning to place Israel back on the road of being the vessel through which the nations would be drawn to worship Yahweh alone. Through the prophet Nathan, God establishes his covenant with David. In this covenant, God promises King David that he would raise from his seed a king who would sit on his throne forever. We read that 2 Samuel 7.13. Additionally, the king would be the son of God and we read that in 2 Samuel 7, 14. These verses serve as clear prophecies which will later be fulfilled in Christ. Through David, God provided the people of Israel with a king who was expected to adhere to the covenant and lead the people in paths of righteousness. Israel would be God's chosen vessel through which the nations would be incorporated into his covenant people. The following verses is a covenant established with David. Now bear with me, it's, it's a long reading. Nathan is called by God to deliver his promises to David. And it reads, Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and have made you a great name, like the name of the great men who are, who are on the earth. 
Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and, and move no more. Nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused you to rest from all your enemies. Also, the Lord tells you that he will make you a house when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and, and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you, and your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. And we read that in Second Samuel chapter 7, verses 8 through 16. The promises made to David in Second Samuel 7, 8 through 16 are referred to as a covenant in other passages in the Bible. See, 2 Samuel 23.5 and Psalms 89.3. It would be through David that the promises to Abraham of blessing the nations in Genesis 12.1-3 would be realized. We can also see this connection in the following verses. God promises Abraham that kings should come from you, anticipated, anticipating the kingship of David. And we see that in Genesis 17.6. These two covenants, the Abrahamic and the Davidic covenant, share the same themes of possessing international reputation, land inheritance, and descendants. Any blessing that God bestows on his people is not for their sake alone, but so they can be a blessing to the nations. Yahweh had promised to make Abraham's name great, which finds fulfillment in David's kingship. David goes from being an insignificant shepherd boy to king of the nation of Israel. His reputation grew by his military conquests, keeping in mind that it was God who was with him and whom cut all his enemies from before him. David was also given rest from all his enemies, though short-lived. It was during this temporary, temporary period of rest that Israel controls the major boundaries of the land promised to Abraham. The absence of the previous hostilities with the surrounding nations was a contrast and relief in comparison to the unrest in the period of the judges. The promises of greatness by way of land and people from the Abrahamic promise find, its, find initial fulfillment in the Davidic covenant. The Davidic promise is a continuation of the Mosaic covenant. The covenant with Moses is given in Exodus 19 verses 5 through 6, where Israel was called to be God's special treasure a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. God provided his will and direction through his laws. We read that those in Exodus 20, chapters 20 through 23, and eventually the promised land in which to be a contrast people amongst the nations. These expectations continue for the Israelites under the kingship of David, who would lead them in following God's will. David would be the leader appointed to guide Israel in fulfilling their missional role in continuation with the Abrahamic and Mosaic covenants. In order for them to be a contrast community, King David would guide Israel to live in conformity to God's laws, the commandments previously established in the Sinai covenant. The quality of David's leadership will be determined by his ability to lead Israel in keeping the Mosaic Covenant. This would also be a standard for measuring the success and faithfulness of later kings. We read that in 2 Kings 18, uh, chapters 18 through 23. For example, King Hezekiah was considered, considered a good leader, for he held fast to the Lord, he did not depart from him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. We read that in 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 6. Though the surrounding nations had kings rule over its people, David's style of leadership would be different, which would be in alignment with God's heart. 
So each covenant that God made with Israel was not to invalidate the previous covenants, but to confirm and continue them. The covenant with David was established to fulfill the previous covenants with Abraham and Moses. It shows God's faithfulness to Israel and also his love for the nations because ultimately they were to be the vessels through which God's name would be known. David, the anointed king, would be the one who would fulfill and lead the people to comply with the will and ways of God instead of serving other gods. Also, he would promote a return to proper worship, reigniting the intimacy with their holy God, which had been lost. By encouraging Israel to follow God's law and proper worship, King David would nourish their missional identity and role to spread God's glorious presence throughout the entire cosmos. Proper tabernacle and later temple worship would serve as a way to reinvigorate the connection with God, therefore rekindling Israel's missional purpose amongst the nations. As long as their worship in the tabernacle was pleasing in God's sight, God could dwell in their midst and be in close relationship with Israel. God's presence in the tabernacle and temple served as a replica of what he desired on a much grander scale. The temple was a miniature version of a much greater vision. Israel would be the temple through which God's presence would expand to the entire world. In the same way God dwelt in the temple, his presence would one day fill the earth. His chosen people, Israel, would be the conduits through which his presence would be felt and his name known throughout the earth. The Davidic covenant shows God's faithfulness in keeping with the covenants with Abraham and Moses. The grace extended to Israel was because they would be the ones who would carry out God's mission on earth of blessing the nations and drawing them to a relationship with the one true Lord. When closing the Old Testament, we see the promised king that would come from the seed of David and establish an eternal kingdom did not arrive. And with each generation, the desire and anxiety to see the coming king increased. We read this in Isaiah Chapter 9, verses 1-7 through seven. The righteous king would restore the people of Israel back into covenant relationship with the one true God. In turn, their missional purpose would be restored, which is to be a light for all nations, which is made possible through their adherence and obedience to God's will and ways. Through their faithfulness to Yahweh, they would be a showcase, a display, for all the nations to see the goodness of God. To the coming king would return the, the domain lost by the sinful human, and he would establish his eternal kingdom throughout the earth. At last, the mission of God of restoring fallen creation would be fulfilled through this king of glory. The promise of an eternal king to arise in David's family was repeated over and over to David himself, to Solomon, and again and again in the Psalms and by the prophets Amos, Isaiah, Micah, Jeremiah, and Zechariah over a period of some 500 years. In the fullness of time, the angel Gabriel was sent to Nazareth to Mary and said, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. In this child, the Davidic promises found their fulfillment. For, more, for a more comprehensive study, a course is available at senttotheworld.org. This course will review the missional heart of God throughout the entire scriptures from the Old and New Testament. Be sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel and visit our social media outlets. God bless.